All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Data Resilient Spectrum Cast, joined by the illustrious group, my co-host, Randy Arsenal. Hey, Randy. Cheers. And Tricia and Sean, our subject matter experts. Good morning, folks. Yeah, hello, everybody. Hey, great. All right. Today's topic is going to be MFA or what we call multi-factor authentication. Now, we've seen a lot of this, and you probably take advantage of this in everyday life when it comes to logging into websites, and especially around the banking and finance industry, you log in, put in username and password, and it says, hey, we've just sent you a code to the phone number we have on file, you put it in, you can log in, right? But now more applications are requiring this to ensure that bad actors don't get in and, and mess with data sets. Uh, Sean, can you just kind of give us an overview of kind of what is MFA and, and that sort of thing? Yeah, sure. I mean, multi-factor authentication is pretty simple, right? And instead of using one piece of information to identify who you are, like for instance, a password, which is what I've been using since I started in computers a long time ago, now you use two pieces of information, right? Or multiple pieces of information. And, you know, I know, Steve, you mentioned uh, uh, text messages, SMS messages, but of course it doesn't necessarily have to be a text message for the second piece of information for, or for one of the pieces of information. Uh, you can use facial recognition, you can use email, you can use, uh, like back in the day when I first started in cryptography, RSA used to give out, and they probably still do, these little devices that generated a pin code, right? And a secure ID have tag. To, yeah. A secure ID, yeah. Did they change their name these days or? I don't know, actually it's fun. You, you, they, that still exists. They're rarer now because the apps on the phones typically yeah. do the token management. Now, but... Nowadays it's mostly done in software, right? Yeah. But you, know, you used to have a piece of hardware that generated this and you would have to enter that to, to mm -hmm. authenticate to a, to a server. Yeah. Yeah, and biometrics service. too, like facial recognition or thumbprints or any one of several other um, handprints and the like, yeah. retinal scan. Patricia, you've kind of taken the lead when it comes to multi-factor authentication, when it comes specifically to the latest and greatest that we're putting into, into our Spectrum Protect and Protect Plus and our data resilience portfolio. Can you tell us a little bit about um, kind of what we've done, what we're doing and kind of the the ease, you've, you've done a lot of work around, it's very impressive, I'd like to get some insights. Yeah, so I didn't know what to expect either going in because like Sean said, there are so many different ways you can provide that second piece of information. And what we're gonna be doing with Spectrum Protect as the starter um, with the administrators is we'll generate this 32-bit shared secret that you'll plug into either an app on your phone by scanning a QR code or you can actually type it in, but that's pretty tedious. And then it'll um, register an account inside of these apps. And there's tons of these apps out there. Yeah. IBM's got them. There's all kinds of freeware apps. Mm -hmm. And they keep track of your, sec your shared secrets. And then when you need to log on, you simply click on that account and it generates the most recent six digit token. And this is based off of a timing um, account that and these tokens refresh every 30 seconds and so spectrum protect inside the server is using the same shared secret and that same time generation code to make sure that they match now um i did watch uh, a couple of your videos that have to do with multi-factor authentication and and you just mentioned it now where uh, you have to go to a location to get this secret. I'm, I'm curious. So there are applications that will generate this, the multi-factor, that, 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 that other uh, type of authentication to get in. But now I need an account or, or I need to register with some other site. I just, I, we yeah. typically don't get too technical here, but it seemed interesting. And I just was curious from a complexity standpoint, right? Uh, is it complicated or, or is it pretty normal? No, it's actually pretty straightforward. I, I just, when I was trying to think about how does this work? How does this make it more secure? And how secure is it to have on my phone this this generating this app generating these codes? And you know, just like anything, though, like your bank, if if they're sending me text and I've lost my phone or my phone's been stolen, yeah, someone else could access that mm -hmm. code. But with Spectrum Protect, you still have to have your administrator password plus yeah. that six-digit code. 
So to me, it seems a really pretty straightforward and b rather secure. I, I liked it. Yeah, the fact I, I think the fact that you've got both, um, you know, randomly or pseudo randomly generated token values, and that it's on a time sequence. Yeah. Um, really limits the vulnerability, right? So you've got 30 seconds to enter the code. If you don't, it expires, it's invalid after 30 seconds. So, you know, someone would have to be very clever in terms of intercepting it and being able to apply it within that 30 second, you know, period of, of viability, so. Yeah, because that's the worry, like on banking, when they say, oh, you've got 30 minutes to enter this code. What if someone did intercept yeah. that text or something? But yeah. I agree, the 30 seconds, you gotta be on it. And if you don't enter it fast enough, Spectrum Protect will make you re into mm -hmm. the next code. I even think at IBM, the authentication is like five minutes, right? When you go to log in, it's, you put in your username and password and it says, okay, we're gonna send you a, a key. And then it says, okay, you have five minutes to enter it, right? And it usually comes right away, so. Yeah, that's true, that's true. Yeah, that's interesting. That raises an interesting question like, does the disparity between the the rolling 30 seconds and the time allotted to enter it does that introduce a vulnerability because in theory like even though the key only exists for 30 seconds it's technically live or viable for 15 minutes or whatever that's an interesting question i never really right. thought about that i guess you could brute force you know start guessing yeah. right well, yeah. and, and like Spectrum Protect is going to be based off of this shared secret. So if I share that secret to a whole bunch of people, then I've just defeated right. the whole purpose. So, yeah. Or, yeah. or, you know, if I copy that shared secret someplace else, just in case I lose my phone, then I'm kind of limiting. Yeah. Just like writing your password on a piece of paper. To yeah. Which... Well, I mean, that, that, that kind of brings up an interesting discussion. And I've been saying this for a little while, but I think it's worth, it's worth repeating, right? I used to recommend whenever anybody would ask for this, I'd recommend, okay, take your application, one of which happened to be Spectrum Protect mm -hmm. and integrate it with Active Directory or LDAP. And usually they provide these facilities, right? right. But the problem with that is these, these facilities, which cover everything now tend to be huge targets for attack, right? So it, it, it's, the landscape is kind of shifting where it's almost more advantageous to have the smaller applications handle their own security uh, in this way. Well, you've got, <clears throat> you know, like Google Authenticator is very pervasive and free and super easy to use, right? So you've got a lot of these, um, a lot of uh, corporations or services will utilize the standard, the, 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 the sort of QR code standard, and you can, uh, record that token into Google Authenticator, and then, you know, it's fast, it's easy, it's lightweight. You know, it's it's pretty uh, pretty straightforward. But again, is it more vulnerable as a result of that? So, yeah, and I know some companies even have concern about who's generating the initial secret, and so the mm -hmm. things like Google Authenticator and other programs, you can generate your own secret, and you know, like Spectrum Protect allows you to enter that if mm -hmm. you don't want to use Spectrum Protect's shared secret. So I like that extra layer of paranoia if you're there hey, we, right. can, we can meet you there just just well, a, and, and, oh sorry, go ahead, Randy, sorry go ahead. no good no i was no. just going to ask um uh, and definitely follow on uh, i just wanted to ask from a implementation perspective um we're making this announcement in kind of the latest version of our software and protect but let's think about it holistically right when companies do this uh, is this multi-factor authentication going to be backwards compatible? Like if I had, you know, version 7.x or 8.1 or whatever, uh, only because, you know, upgrading for kind of a feature, and, and this is does, doesn't pertain to security features, it kind of pertains to everything, right? Um, can be a little complicated, right? Or I got to kind of make the time to do that. And the time for when I can think about maybe I'm going to do this to, to today or when it becomes available you know, obviously you're, you're vulnerable, right? So what's the status there? So when, when we come out with the Spectrum Protect one, it will be server-based. So your server's got to be up to the level, but if you're using like an administrator command line to log on, that can be down level. Um, so you don't have that dependency. One thing to think about though, is what about all the scripts you might've written that are using admin logins and how will those be able to work with the, um, requiring a password. And unfortunately, they're not going to be able to use that secret token. So it'll be for live people logging on and you'll still have in your scripts, which I think is a vulnerability, 
set passwords. Hmm. Right well, which goes back kind of, <clears throat> yeah, to Sean's point that if you, if these are able to be integrated into LDAP or, you know, uh, any kind of a, a single sign on type framework, then that in theory would mitigate some of that, but, but not entirely because yeah. they have their own vulnerabilities. I was, I was actually kind of poking around a little bit in, in, in preparation for this call and I came across um, an article talking about sort of the the risks or some of the problems potentially that that exist within uh, uh, multi-factor authentication and and one that I thought was interesting I never really again considered it was recycled phone numbers right so the fact that a lot of these are based on text messages you know numbers they're not supposed to be recycled but they do occasionally get recycled so you could theoretically have a situation where you know you have an account you have an access for a while you know and you were using um, auto-generated text messages as your as your authentication key and token and now somebody else has that number and if, if they could figure out a way to you know make the connection there um, that's one potential vulnerability which is one of the reasons why a lot more uh, apps are leveraging um, the security apps like Google Authenticate and, and others just because it eliminates that risk but the other factor is that um, you know it's not it's not just the phone numbers that are that are problematic I mean the 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 first part of the multi-factor the first factor is your you know username and password which these can be you know intercepted they can be hacked that's you know that's not new that's been around for a while so it's like you've added a level of protection against you know somebody stealing or or you know getting access to your credentials you know illegally or or in some disruptive way but you haven't eliminated it you've you've made it harder but you haven't really eliminated it it seems like uh, hardware-based solutions, like if you've got a, uh, what's it called, a trusted platform computing chip or something in your laptop or your phone or whatever, that uses a localized hardware encryption and a localized you know, key management system, essentially, that kind of seems like where it's gonna ultimately go. It's all gonna be based on some kind of biometric or something that's you know, gonna require you, if somebody wants to crack your, your, your credentials, they'll have to do like the, you know, a uh, spy movie and like pull your eye out and stick it in front of the rental scan or something. So it, it's going to make it hopefully hard enough that it becomes effectively impossible or near impossible. But, you know, there's always going to be people clever enough to figure out how to get around it. Well, that's true of every piece of security, right? I yeah. mean, it's, you know, there's nothing that is impenetrable. It's, it's yeah. just a matter of how much they're going to have to work to get through it and yeah. how vulnerable it is. That's why they call it system hardening. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's, it's it's why the Kremlin today still uses typewriters, IBM Selectric typewriters, too. <laughs> right? Because yep. that's yep. really hard to steal, right? Well, you got to go to go to Moscow to get your uh, there's <laughs> the there's down. tech entrepreneurs who who rely exclusively on handwritten notes for exactly that reason. Like yeah. they don't they don't want to have a digital footprint. They don't want to have anything that can be compromised. So yeah. it's funny. Yeah, and I think like Spect and Protect, you know, we, we're not relying on getting a text message. So we're, we've taken that extra level of security. Mm -hmm. But once again, it comes down to, are the administrators going to embrace this and take that extra step? Or are they going to be lazy and not turn it on or turn it on and, you know, find shortcuts or something? So basically, I, hang well, I, I, got a new, a I got a news flash for you. Some of them <laughs> are going to be lazy and not turn it on and find yeah. shortcuts. <laughs> Well, most it, it's the uh, way of the world. Yeah, but right. I mean, a lot of companies now have much more, I don't want to say restrictive, but much more stringent policies around around MFA, right? Like they sort of require that for apps of a certain class. Now, I don't know if data protection falls into that category, but I, I got to believe any company of any size yeah, is going to have a pretty strict mandate that says any, you know, credentialed application requires some sort of MFA, but yeah, well, that's not true yet, I'm sure. But it, it does bring up, you know, kind of thoughts and, and we've, we've already started touching on a couple of them, right? Is, um, you know, you're going to mandate something and then obviously someone in the company, because this happens all the time at every company, someone's going to say, well, we can't do that because, right? So, right. you know, what are the downsides? And Randy, you mentioned a couple from the, from the, uh, from the, uh, from the recycled phone numbers to your existing username and password. Trisha, you mentioned a couple that talked about, well, yeah, your scripts won't work, right? So then folks are going to start to say, well, if I can't do it there, you know, what's the point of doing it? Doing it? What other kind of downsides are there to multi-factor authentication? And and as you we answer that, Trisha, I saw something interesting in one of the videos you had done saying about how we've actually tied multi-factor authentication to the dual command approval uh, concept, if you want to expound upon that. 
Yeah, so if I'm an administrator and I have enough authority and I'm, I don't want to be hassled with MFA and lazy, then I'm going to try and turn it off for my administrator and say, oh, Trisha doesn't need it. We're going to turn it off for myself. Well, with <clears throat> Spectrum Protect, you first of all, can't turn it off for yourself. And secondly, even if I go, hey, Sean, turn it off for me. If your command approval is on, we would need How two administrators to approve that. So you'd really have to get to a couple people in cahoots with you to get it off. Sounds like Sean's I'd trying be looking, to extort you for yeah, some cash. I would be looking for a good paycheck to- <laughs> Yeah, 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 of course. <laughs> yeah, I can do it for you. It's at, uh, what's it worth to you, yeah. How about <laughs> other downsides that we can think of? Well, I mean, I, I suppose the obvious one is just convenience, right? I mean, people, especially if it's an application that you use frequently, like every time you log in, you have to go through this process. It adds time, it adds extra steps, which arguably it's a small price to pay for that security, but the reality is from a user experience standpoint, people aren't gonna- People aren't going to like it, you know. It also introduces another step if you, let's say, like you get a new phone, right? Any of your stored security tokens have to be refreshed, and it's a whole thing you got to go through. So again, it's there's always a convenience price to be paid. So you got to balance the security aspect versus the inconvenience, as with a lot of these security things and practices, I guess. Great. Yeah. And the other another thing is if you have the same administrator um, looking after multiple Spectrum Protect servers. You don't want to have to have multiple secrets for mm. the same administrator on these servers. So you have to make sure you've set up either the ability, the Spectrum Protect can update all the administrators with the same name on different servers with the same secrets, or you can do that manually, but you've got to make sure that that's in place. Good, good, good okay. points. I think okay. that's the advantage of using the apps, like the, the, the mobile apps, the authentication apps, is that they at least make it really easy. It's quick, it's straightforward. Very user friendly. It's Yep. Scan that QR code. Although, you know, the text message thing, at least on iPhone, I'm sure it's the same on Android, you have the ability to automatically copy and paste from your messages. So like you're you're putting in your authentication code. That is very convenient. Like that saves a couple of steps. So if the authentication apps could figure out a way to do that, that would be a step in the right direction. But yeah. And Randy, just from a, uh, as we always take the, the spin on the wheel of misfortune, um, mm -hmm. if you if we go back and think about it, it any anything we can tie to MFA, whether either they should have used it, obviously they probably should have, or they did use it and it didn't help them. Anything we can tie to that? I mean, I would assume that any any large scale data breach that involved some kind of phishing or social engineering or, or credential, you know, access, where I believe at least some of them fall into that category. I mean, that's a pretty obvious one, right? So you could you could argue that had they been using MFA. The probability of that occurring would have been re reduced, maybe not eliminated, but at least reduced. So there's tons of those, I guess. Great. So that'd be kind of an obvious one. Yeah. Trisha, Sean, any any parting words besides just Spectrum Protect, but in general <laughs> regarding MFA? Any thoughts, Sean? This is a good thing. It's uh, it's moving forward, right? Well, we're going to take advantage of it. We're all going to have to. We have to take advantage of it. We have no choice. Turn it on. <laughs> take one for the team. Yeah, and, and when no you choice see the product, when a GA is um, here shortly, it's it's simple, it's easy, and it can really make a difference when it comes to safety. Great. Team, thank you very much for participating this morning in the Data Resilience Podcast. Um, everybody, I hope you have a great weekend, and uh, we'll talk to you soon.